Good evening. Thank you for joining us at New Wine, New Wineskins for our event tonight. We are really excited about this. We're excited to have you with us. We're excited to have a great group of panelists to discuss this important vital subject. And it's our documentary premiere on from isolation to inclusion. How do we move toward full belonging in terms of all communities, especially the disability community, to make sure that all people are invited in, welcomed and included and belong as full participants in our community. And so we're gonna first show our documentary this evening. I'll introduce the panelists after the documentary, but before we get going with the premiere, I want to ask my good friend, uh, New Wine Advisor over the years, Mr. Steve Hanamura to open in prayer for us. Steve, would you please? Thank you, Paul. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for New Wine and their commitment to serving people with disabilities. Bless our conversation. May people be able to learn and listen. And we just love you, Lord. Thank you again for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. And as we begin, the documentary will be shown first. And then after the documentary is finished, we're gonna go right in to a panel discussion for the remainder of our time uh, with people who were participants in the documentary. And this is their life. This is what they're passionate about. They're leaders in the community in a variety of spheres with concern to move toward full belonging for people with disabilities, that all people are treated as equals with equity and dignity and justice. So Matt, take it away as we go into From Isolation to Inclusion, New Wine's documentary. Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, the director of the Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins. Welcome to our documentary on the subject of from isolation to invitation, addressing the subject of disabilities. In what follows, you'll have opportunity to hear from people who are leaders in the sphere, nonprofit organizations, working with people in the disability community, people who are educators and advocates. You'll also hear from pastors, people who have a passionate heart uh, for people with disabilities to make sure that they are invited in and vital participants in our church communities and the like. And also you'll be hearing from medical leaders, people in the sphere of medicine who have a real passion for engaging in constructive terms, those with disabilities. I believe you'll find this documentary very helpful and illuminating and even encouraging and helping to build understanding, sensitivity, awareness, and hopefully courage so that we ourselves are part of the solution, moving beyond stigma to really a shared life involving those with disabilities. Thank you for joining us and blessings to you in your own journey in terms of engaging people with disabilities, that they are included and not isolated, but invited in to our communities at large. Thank you. In this first part of the documentary, we will deal with the problem of isolation and how people with disabilities often experience limited to no access. They experience prejudice and stigma. They endure a lack of resources. They experience severe hurt and pain and how that pain can be so severe and the burden so heavy that they can give in to the isolation and just not seek themselves to participate given how they've been excluded so often. Access is opportunity. Access is opportunity to get into a building. Access is an opportunity to be in a place where other people are. Access is, 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 is it, it really is opportunity to participate and thrive. But once I got into public high school and college, then there were teachers that didn't think I could participate very well. There were people who uh, spoke or wouldn't date me because my, of my Japanese ethnicity and or blindness, and sometimes it was both. So that was a very difficult process to understand 
when was I being discriminated against? Finding resources has been extremely difficult, and it's really knowing the right people and finding the right resources and the programs that would meet the needs of our son as well as my friends. And it's been really hard because the school systems as well as the services that supply for later in life, they don't all know where the resources are and how to get those individualized help. Busting stigma, that would be the top challenge. Um, it can come in the way of discrimination, bullying, uh, labeling, um, tons of different things. Um, a lot of people who have mental health illnesses um, have to face stigma every day. Um, it's what they faced before they even started receiving help. People with disabilities have been facing challenges relative to access forever. And, and uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it can be a cumulative weight that people carry for, uh, relative to access, relative to meeting people. You never get the opportunity that maybe one day you say, I don't want the opportunity, and you don't, you don't even try to participate. And I think that happens, that happens more, than, more than we know. If you think about, uh, let's say our brothers and sisters who face a variety of challenges that are disabled, um, I think it's easy for them to become isolated. I think it's easy for us to, to really just not be aware that they're near the bottom. There's a lot of hurt um, from how church people have responded to people with disabilities. I have friends who just outright feel um, that they're not welcome, have been told they're not welcome, um, given places to sit that are not in the sanctuary because of their disabilities, um, people who experienced hurt due to incorrect theologies um, around things like healing and around um, understanding of, of God's role in, um, our, in our bodies. Gateway Church was built in the 1960s. Um, typical church that said we got to get something up for people for worship, but as far as ADA uh, requirements, those were not thought about at all. And so Gateway has a very, very uh, unaccessible and isolating facility. People who, are, who go there probably haven't seen it uh, in that way, but they have now. But that's still isolating. They should be able to be in the worship center. They should be able to have access, sing, hear the people at Gateway singing, and be able to have access like everybody else. What if? The gospel was just more accessible to someone because it's being presented by a person with a disability. In the second part of the documentary, we move toward the theme of inclusion, that invitation to inclusion, where we seek after creating access, creating opportunities, creating community, developing a sense of a need for trust, to trust those who have disabilities, not to discount them, not to be inquisitional, but to be inquisitive, to appreciate them and to affirm their agency. I got hit by a car when I was two. I have a spinal cord injury. Uh, I'm a, what's called an incomplete paraplegic, which means that I have uh, feel. Uh, in my case, I have feeling throughout my body. I have a little bit of use below my injury. Um, not as much as I did uh, when I was earlier, but so I, I have uh, I have grown up as a person with a disability. I have uh, lived life uh, prior to the Americans with Disability Act, uh, and and it's uh, it, it's it, it's it's been a, it's been an interesting experience it, doing my job at OHSU. So because I grew up as a person with a disability prior to the Americans with Disability Act, where I was not statutorily guaranteed access. I had to learn often to create my own access. Uh, so for example, to, to, uh, I attended a, a, a public school in a very, very small town in southern Indiana starting in the 70s. Uh, that school had three floors and no elevator. And to attend that school, uh, my parents lobbied for me uh, uh, to have uh, not a lift put in, but to have an extra banister added to all the staircases so that I could uh, um, use my arms to basically pull myself up those three flights of stairs, uh, which was, was, was uh, incredibly lucky for me to see how advocacy works because my parents advocated for me. Uh, and I got relatively strong as a result of that. 
Well, it was real. The, uh, the feeling of discrimination was real both as a Japanese person and as a blind person. And the challenge for me was I never knew which reason was the reason. Trying to assimilate not being blind was difficult, although some of my friends and I would walk down the street, never use a cane, never hold on to each other. In fact, one of my friends fell into an open utility hole, but by gosh, he was sighted. And that was more important to fall into an open utility hole than to hang on to somebody because he's blind. The whole involvement with uh, the disability world started with my first master's where I was focusing on education, early childhood, and special ed. Little did I know that four years later, all of that knowledge would be applied to the advocating and servicing for my fragile X syndrome son, who is exhibits similar to autism. Building relationships is really a heartbeat of mine. And you know, creating community. And what I see is that trying to build that same connection with not just my son and community and families, but also the resources and the providers and the services, there's just a real disconnect. And there's a, a lot of isolation that I find in a lot of these communities. My thirst for hope and my quest for rest was probably the initial thing that led me to it. Uh, my last admission uh, was a few years ago, and um, I was transitioned into an intensive outpatient program. Uh, and upon my discharge, I really needed more. I actually didn't want to be discharged. Um, then I was pointed in the direction of NAMI, which was right next door. The unbelief, I would say, is one big challenge. Um, people are oftentimes dismissed as um, acting out possessed or trying to get attention. Um, I think if people begin to really ask the hard questions um, and trust the experiences that, uh, the lived experiences that peers are having, uh, they will be able to receive more help and have more support. If people begin to really, really isolate um, or not able to function in everyday life um, or it affects their activities of daily living, um, that's when you begin to think, okay, there may be, maybe there is something disabling about the condition. Um, and in that regards, there's a bit of a connection. Um, as you know, there's the American Disabilities Act uh, that was passed, uh, which protects people not just from physical disabilities, but also mental illnesses as well. The helping physician, or the nurse, or the counselor, or the pastor, or the interested party, has to find out what is the person going to tell them that they need to know in order to help care for them. If the patient is, is not given that opportunity, is not drawn out, if, if the situation is not open enough for them to express themselves, uh, we will never know what is necessary to helping them through a, through a resilience that brings them back to a satisfactory position in life. In this third part of the documentary, we deal with the need for good values, better values, better perceptions, keener insights in how we engage the disability community, better theology, an attitude that is really one of desire for engagement rather than to discount those with disabilities, to really move forward in a way that we see them from God's point of view and not from a distorted human point of view that writes people off, that further isolates, again, good values, better perceptions, a deeper, richer theology, attitudes that are really noble and pleasing to God. You know, we've got to overcome the sense of isolation because isolation means you're not engaged. In the in the multiple relationships of life, you got to get out to church. You got to get out to the ball game. You got to get out to the to family parties. You've got to participate in life because it's when you are participating in life that the energy of the Holy Spirit is working in your life so fully to give you a sense of 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 a being a whole person. Stephen's place is a an assisted living facility uh, designed to uh, uh, provide. Uh, housing and support and a variety of program uh, uh, for uh, adults with intellectual disabilities. And uh, 
There are 41 individual apartments. It's an extremely high quality facility. I've toured there with many, many uh, families and many individuals, uh, many of whom were not uh, facing any sort of special challenges. And they usually say to me, well, I'd love to live here and just see the impact that living in a community, that receiving the kind of care and support they receive, that having a, a job when maybe they didn't have a job in the past, uh, to see the changes that that's brought about in their lives. And so I immediately think of one particular resident who I've just seen develop incredible self-confidence over the past several years because he's, you know, he's, uh, he's really taken care of himself in a way that I think he really didn't think he could do just a short time ago. Uh, one of the uh, women that works, uh, that lives at Stevens Place recently in, enrolled in her first college class. So, you know, these are the stories that, these are just examples of many uh, instances where, where uh, people living in this community where we have full-time staff, uh, professional staff, uh, really dedicated to meeting their needs. Our mission and vision really is to create a community of individuals with disabilities that um, have a place to live and a place to be supported in having as much life as anybody else has. I'm just as excited to be here and learn from our residents and um, grow with them. Uh, we have some really incredible stories about the resilience of people, about um, the way that our residents look at themselves. Uh, our residents don't look at themselves as people with disabilities, they look at themselves as people, which we should look at everybody with a disability as a person, as a human being. Um, but they come to the table with such a different outlook on life um, and excitement for what's going on, um, a positive attitude that honestly can't be matched sometimes. Uh, and, and they don't look at their disability as being their disability. They look at it as being, you know, just part of who they are. Um, and, you know, I've had residents who have said, oh, my disability is that I'm short. I love that because at the end of the day, if that's your biggest challenge, and if that's what you see as your biggest challenge, then you can accomplish so much more. Um, and, and I think it's our job as individuals in the community to support people with disabilities in, in looking at themselves in that way and for us to look at them in that way. So the disability paradox refers to um, a empirically proven phenomenon where people who have some degree of disability oftentimes self-report a higher quality of life than people who don't have disability. And it's an interesting concept because some people will look at someone with a disability of whatever stripe, whether it's a physical disability, a cognitive disability, and say, well, that person's quality of life must not be so good. Uh, given the fact that the self-report is actually the opposite in many cases, people have wondered whether or not there are a couple of things going on. One is an appreciation of life that people without disability take for granted. Um, so you and I walked in from the parking lot and I didn't think twice about the fact that I walked in from the parking lot and that it was a day when I was enjoying being outside and taking a deep breath. I took all that for granted because it happened all the time and I don't think about it. People with disabilities may think about it because they value things that I take for granted. So I wrote a master's thesis on um, a biblical theology of disability that looks at scriptures looking at from Genesis to Revelation um, and what is God's view of disability, of broken bodies, um, and what does the community, um, the beloved community, look like um, in scripture as it relates to people with disabilities. I first got into the um, field of disability theology and disability ministry. Um, it was my first job out of, um, well, I guess, first job as an adult. And um, I was in a vocational training program uh, in Northern California where we um, taught vocational skills to adults with disabilities. And I, at the same time, I was also a pastor um, at a small church there. And it was the... Um, looking at those two worlds and seeing how they very rarely met, um, seeing the way that this one group saw the world and um, saw things like relationship and community and timefulness and how this other world that should have a welcome just somehow didn't seem to know about them, didn't seem to have a connection, didn't seem to be open. There's this um, underlying some of our American values um, that have come into the church and 
um, whether that's things like how we view time, how we view beauty, how we view success, um, all of those also play into the way we do church and the way that we do our programs. And so to me, the primary concern is if we're leading first with programs and what's undergirding those is incorrect theology and values that aren't necessarily what scriptural values, what they should be for the church, but we're basing those on like cultural values, that we're going to have programs that don't really hit the mark. And so for me, I think we have to step back, look at our theology, look at our values and correct those pieces before we move forward. I think the biggest barriers for us are really attitudinal. Um, people are uncomfortable with disability. They don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to say. And and if they have no experience with someone with a disability, they may feel okay about them not being there or being left out. We have three main scriptures we use as foundation for the work that we do. We start with Psalm 139. It says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And we believe that. We believe God intentionally designed each person and that he has um, work for them to do. And then we move to 1 Corinthians 12 and that wonderful word picture of the body of Christ. And throughout that chapter, we hear about how each person has a place and is placed intentionally in the body of Christ. And in verse 22, then we see that it says, and those parts that appear to be weaker are indispensable. And we believe that people with disabilities appear to be weaker and often are not valued or uh, dismissed or left out because we humans don't see the value. But we firmly believe that that passage speaks directly about people who are marginalized and left out, uh, particularly due to disability. So it says they're indispensable, without which the, comp the whole is not complete. And that is a foundation for much of what we do. And then we go from there to 1 Peter 4.10. And that verse really talks about how each person has been gifted and needs to use their gifts uh, to the glory of God. And there's no qualifier on that verse. It says each person, every person. And we believe um, that people with disabilities have gifts to bring that are uniquely theirs, crafted in their mother's womb, placed in the body of Christ for their unique role and purpose. And we always rejoice when it's a light bulb moment and and. People go, ah, okay, now tell me what we can do. We had a couple in there that had uh, has had a number of children who have had disabilities. But one of the, the father of, of, of the couple came to me and said, um, would you baptize our son if, if we became a member? I almost felt like saying, well, we'll baptize your son even if you're not. But their previous experience, I felt, was tragic. Um, their son has, you know, has some physical as well as mental disabilities, um, hard for me to talk about it because I can't, I can't imagine how unloved this must have made Brian and their son feel, that they wouldn't baptize him, even though he wanted to show his relationship with Jesus in a very simple way. They wouldn't do it. They just wouldn't do it. And I said to the father, I said, we'd be happy to have Brian baptized the gateway. And he and his wife sobbed right there in the discovery room because they said that is that is so wonderful. We've been waiting for a place that would understand our needs. And not only did Brian get baptized, but we, we had Brian uh, baptized by his father. And it was one of the most meaningful baptisms I have ever seen at Gateway Church or at any church I've ever been a part of. It was so, so touching. It just, people were dabbing their eyes because it was just such a beautiful example of the embrace of Jesus of all people. In this fourth and final part of the documentary, we deal with the need to be bold, to be courageous, to be inquisitive, to become inclusion natives, to be vulnerable, to be learners, to become more creative, to realize that those in the disability community have so much to teach us. They are not to be seen as the objects of our charity as we affirm their agency we will realize that they have so much to offer toward human flourishing for the community at large. May we realize that there's so much more and we're missing out by not providing access, by isolating. Let's realize together that as we grow together, involving people in the disability community be a part of the whole community, a more inclusive, expansive community, 
we will all be richer as a result. I look forward to going there with you. God's blessings. Michaela Connery uh, has a wonderful term. Uh, she, she describes uh, herself and members of her generation as inclusion natives. So what does she mean by that? What she means is we didn't grow up in a, um, in a community where that say, for example, uh, individuals with intellectual disabilities were uh, schooled somewhere else. We grew up with uh, those individuals being mainstreamed right into our classroom. And she says, you know, that didn't just affect those individuals. It's affected members of my generation in a, in a way that, you know, many of the people I, from my generation that I talked to about this feel as if there just isn't really any other way to live than to be a member of a community where um, everyone's represented. People of different ages, people of different races, people of you know, uh, different backgrounds, uh, different faiths, and you know, individuals facing you know, the, all the challenges that, that oftentimes you know, people and their families have to face. And uh, so she, it's really inspiring to talk to her and, and uh, um, and I share that belief that you know, we'd be a better uh, city, you know, we'd be a better church, we'd be a better uh, workplace, et cetera, uh, were we to um, you know, devote resources and, and make the commitment uh, to include all members of our community. And then greater community, uh, my, it's really my goal for our greater community when it comes to disabilities is that Everybody understands that, you know, if we look at disability just as a difference and if we look at disability as something that brings so much more to the table and can enrich, enrich our lives um, just from the standpoint that it provides somebody who looks at things differently, somebody who's experienced things differently. Uh, when we stop and listen to what that means and, and, and how that can change what we do, our society can become so much better. A lot of times disability is a hard topic to approach because we don't know what we don't know. And uh, so I think the main thing is ask questions, be inquisitive. Uh, if you are concerned, feeling awkward, apprehensive, uh, the best way to diffuse that is to ask questions and uh, find people to talk with about that. If that's too hard, then do some reading and then find someone who already has experience with someone with a disability and start talking to your friends about that. Someone, I'm sure with all the friendships we have in the world today, somebody knows someone with a disability or someone has a family member with a disability. So start talking with people you already know to begin the process. I would like to see the faith community um, make an effort to uh, launch a war on stigma, um, on stigma itself. Um, it definitely would help um, to increase access to care, um, increase access to uh, providers, several different things. Um, I know from my experience, I've learned that to pathologize certain emotions um, at their extremes is, is better than to deal with something once something has been acted out upon. Um, so that kind of speaks to the notion that prevention is better than cure. Um, or for me, in my faith tradition, that obedience is better than sacrifice. Um, that's something that I've learned. Um, it was unfortunate how I learned it, um, but I did learn it. Um, I think I'm trying to practice that every day. Rather than looking at them as a, an inherent limitation to be overcome or, or cured, if you will, to acknowledge that we all have our own level of disability, if you want to look at it very broadly. And how can we understand it as a way of expressing ourselves, coming together in community, and being richer as a result? The best way to relate to somebody with a disability is to re relate to them as a person and to, 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 to establish communication uh, through commonality. So that, so that uh, for example, if I can't get into a building and you see that I can't get into that building, perhaps don't come up to me and say, hey, I see you couldn't get into that building, but say, hey, is there something I can do? Is there a way that I can uh, do something to, 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 to help you today? Or to, to just to be a friend at that day. So, so just to communicate with the, to the person as a person. Mm -hmm. not, not as a not, not as a uh, 
something other than a person. A very succinct vision of what I see for um, the church and how we engage people with disabilities. Um, we found in just looking at scriptures that refer to the body of Christ. And so I think about Romans and I think about when it says that um, each member belongs to the other. And to me, that, that means that we each have an aspect of vulnerability, a, a role that we play, and we have responsibility for the other. And so if I tell someone that I belong to them, they have a sense of responsibility to own that with me and to, and to treat me well in that. And I have to be vulnerable in that. And for a lot of us, that's a really tough place to be. Um, but I have a lot of friends who have disabilities who, um, depending on how long they've had them, have had to learn vulnerability from some of them from a very early age um, and teach me a lot about what it actually looks like to be vulnerable with others and to still want deep community and to still want to be in that place knowing that what it requires is absolute vulnerability. Um, to me, that paints a much like more beautiful picture of what the body of Christ can look like. And I'm not so sure that we get there without full inclusion. The message is always more impactful and more well-received when it's delivered alongside a person with a disability or with a person with a disability than it ever would be from me alone. That's a huge blessing to show and demonstrate people with disabilities in leadership in the church, um, in empowering them and demonstrating modeling that it can be done and it's important to do. If you don't have a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities in your life, you're missing out in the great richness of difference that God created in the family of Christ and in the world. And so I encourage you to reach out, to consider that, to look internally and think about creating space for um, considering people with disabilities as being a part of the body of Christ, a valuable part, and that there's something you can learn from being in relationship with them. And the second one is that we can do better as a church, as a community, as a society, as a world, as a culture, and multiple cultures across the country, we can do better, including people with disabilities and recognizing their gifts and not thinking of them as less than anybody else. Well, I think I need to tell you what Michael, quadriplegic, man 37 years old, moved in next door to me some 35, 40 years ago. When I went over to visit Michael, I realized he was married, drove to work every day. Um, in the midst of our conversation, he said to me, Dr. Potter, you able-bodied people will never know as much about life as those of us with disability know. I realized he was right. I realized that disabled persons are spiritual giants who have risen, their resilience has, has carried them to some heights of spiritual greatness that I cannot achieve. I want to thank all of you for joining us as panelists and again for all those who've joined us to watch this. You'll be able to see this at our YouTube channel uh, within what, Matt, the next uh, few days. Uh, would that be the case? And I just want to say thanks to Matt for all the work he's doing at our YouTube channel with others like Tony Wynn. Uh, just really appreciate all that work. Of course, with doing something live, uh, there's always the challenge with uh, the technology, with the uh, slow motion, with uh, things happening like that. So thank you for your patience. I'm actually not live tonight. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taped here. So, okay, so that's just to keep everything safe. But uh, that said, I wanna introduce our panelists and they're gonna be answering a variety of questions. Uh, all these panelists were in the documentary. And uh, before I get into introducing them, I wanna say special thanks to Donovan Potts, who was uh, the person responsible for filming uh, the material for us as far as taking the, the final um, tapings 
and uh, synthesizing it into the documentary as we requested. I also wanna thank Lynette Boyer and Matt Farla for all the work they've been doing uh, the past several weeks to get this ready. We hope to add closed captioning uh, in the near future. Appreciate the questions on that. Uh, so many things we're trying to account for and we have a long way to go at New Wine. Also wanna say thank you to Sarah Mannon and Derek Peterson for all the work they did in helping to uh, you know, film with us and to help me with coordination months and months and months ago. So uh, just wanna say thank you to them. We also wanna say special thanks to the Cooney Foundation and uh, Greg Goodwin, who I'll start out introducing, is gonna share a little bit at the end about uh, the Cooney Foundation and their work. So I'll, we'll, we'll come to that later. Uh, but uh, as I just mentioned, Greg Goodwin is one of our panelists. He's the board chair of the Wayne D. Cooney and Joan E. Cooney Foundation. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Paul. Trudy Sang, uh, partner in crime at New Wine. She is the disability community advocate for New Wine, New Wineskins. Robert Potter, uh, MD, PhD, Emeritus Senior Scholar Center for Ethics and Healthcare at OHSU and was one of our uh, advisors for the American Association for the Advancement for Science and Templeton Grant for Multnomah Seminary and New Wine for our seminary grant, how to incorporate science into our seminary curriculum. Uh, Robert, thank you for joining us tonight as well. Steve Hanamura, who is the founder of Hanamura Consulting. Ian Jaquis, who is the Interim ADA Coordinator at Oregon Health and Science University. Tom Shive, Lead Pastor, Gateway Church, Portland. Ruben Alvarado, Pastor of Local Outreach, Imago Dei Community, Portland. Mario Odigizawa, Odigizua, <clears throat> who is the uh, here, who is a peer delivered services provider presently. Heather Stenberg, who is the executive director of Stevens Place that you saw featured in the documentary. And Mona Firstenau, who is currently a disabilities advocate and a speaker and consultant. I don't think I missed anyone and there's gonna be a quiz on the names and how to spell them later this evening uh, that everyone has to take before they sign off. Uh, and that's all those who are out there in the broader YouTube, Facebook world. So um, let's get right into the questions for our panelists. I just, I wanna thank you again, your passion, your expertise, your commitment to the themes we're discussing here. And uh, so let's get into the questions. You know, you haven't had most of you an opportunity to interact with one another. I, I don't think most of you have known one another. A few of you know one another, but not everyone's ever interact with one another is you heard one another share and you had an opportunity to watch it before we took it live and people can watch it again at our YouTube channel. Matt will talk more about that later. Uh, what were your initial observations and impressions related to what one another shared? Because the documentary is really about the people, uh, the people who we seek to um, really have full participation with, uh, people with disabilities, that they're a, much a part of the community as we are and we're as much a part of the community as they are. And then people like yourselves who are wanting to make sure that we're about full participation. So what did you hear from one another that stood out for you? Uh, Ruben, let's start with you because you're the first one I saw as I looked at the panelists. So that's, that's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna wing it. So Ruben. <laughs> that's great, thanks Paul. Um, you know, for me, I was encouraged. Um, I loved that it started off with this idea of access being opportunity. And, you know, that just was, that was perfect. And then I was, as I saw each person speak, I was thinking about the fact that each one of us has a certain level of access and belonging um, in society, in our church, in our workplaces. And we, having recognized because of friends and family and people in our lives who have shown us that not everybody actually shares that same access. And so I found myself encouraged seeing so many people from different walks of life choose to 
fight for access for others, to um, leverage their belonging and their place um, in, in societies and in faith communities and at schools to leverage that for others. And so we have a lot more work to do. There's um, a lot of work to be done, but it was very encouraging to see that um, there's a lot of you out there um, doing this work. And this really is a small group of us that, that are doing that work. And so, um, yeah, just very encouraged. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, Mona and then Heather, how about uh, the two of you next, please? Uh, I concur with Ruben that I, I'm i encouraged, but I, I'm also cautious, I guess, that we aren't making plans for without making space for the voices of people with disabilities to really share what they desire. And so I, I always think think that I come from the, I th come from the position that at per we've been paternalistic a little bit in in the church at large no matter what your denomination that our our attitude has been one of mercy and of ministry and care for rather than seeing value and elevating value and dignity and respect that allows for making space for leadership and voice and visibility and I think we need to always be careful of that attitude of of paternalism, I, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, I think, I, and so I'm encouraged um, that we begin to speak, but I, I want to caution uh, that we allow space and make space for, for true voices to speak their, their desires and their needs. That's, that's really good. And we'll have opportunity, no doubt, to return to that uh, important point that you've raised. Heather and then Ian. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having us tonight. I would say, again, I was encouraged. It's nice to um, be with a group of people who have similar um, cares and beliefs. And um, that's always encouraging. I think for me, the thing that I kept pulling away from was uh, being able to then take all of us and then anybody who's listening or watching this later and um, and having them also then be advocates for that same level of access. And, um, you know, the more that we can put that out there and the more people that are advocating uh, for everybody to have access, I, I think, you know, we'll get there faster. But it, it was a reminder of, because I think many of this us participated in this couple of years ago, year and a half ago, um, it was a reminder of how things still are where they were. Mm -hmm. So, yes, sobering and also encouraging. We have to keep both in mind yeah. is what I hear you saying, let's be excited, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves because there's a lot of work to be done and we need to make sure that we're not paternalistic and we need to stay the course. And I think also what you just said, Heather, it's the matter of if we do it together, who's to the right of us, who's to the left, and collaborate and have solidarity, it's key to building momentum. Ian. I, I, thank you uh, for the opportunity. I was most impressed with uh, and still sort of uh, dumbstruck by the, the scope and the breadth of the participants and the, the, the voices shared and the stories told. Uh, that that I sometimes uh, get lost in myself as a person with a disability and just think about what my needs are. And, and this is a reminder that there are lots of different needs and lots of different uh, ways to, to, to get those needs. The other thing that, that struck me is that, that uh, this is a huge step uh, that, that, that I've heard time and time again that there's a long way to go, but this is progress. And, and this is happening during a pandemic. It would have been easy to, it would have been easy enough to delay this event until after the, the pandemic, but this is going on and this is front of mind. And I think that's, I think that's wonderful and hopeful. And, and I think that's a great message. Mm. Thank you, Ian. I'm thankful that we have Zoom with all the technical <laughs> challenges that we still have, that we have this opportunity to connect in the midst of it. And thanks for your encouragement. And how about Steve and then Mario? Uh, and you'll have to remember this because I'll forget the order. Uh, Trudy, Robert, Greg, and Tom. <laughs> okay. So, Steve. Well, I'm thinking about the contrast between isolation and inclusion. I was sitting in an office in my pastor's office in Eugene, Oregon, so hurt and enraged. I threw a box of Kleenex across the room, almost hit my pastor's left ear, fell to the floor, broke down in tears. And since that time, 
it woke him up. He uh, taught me how to water ski, took me tandem bike riding, but it was the beginning of the real isolation to a friendship. And it, to all of a sudden be sitting here among all of you, it, having a conversation systemically throughout the greater Portland area, it's mind blowing, but long overdue. So I'm very appreciative of both the contrast, the pain of that moment back in Eugene being left out of everything, even though people were nice to me, being nice and saying hello isn't enough, by the way. I need more than that. And then this pastor embraced that. And so now here we are, gonna, we can look at it individually as well as systemically. Thank you, Steve. Mario. Uh, you're muted. Mario, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, sorry, I thought, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, so I feel more understood um, when I heard the panelists uh, share, um, and thank you again for letting me uh, participate, uh, Dr. Maxter, and I, I felt definitely more understood um, just by listening to the um, variety of comments that were shared and experiences. And since the filming of the documentary, I've actually transitioned back into my original role um, with NAMI um, mm -hmm. and was even declared disabled um, by a judge officially um, uh, myself in my own life. So I'm actually mm -hmm. viewing things a lot differently um, through that lens now and seeing myself, okay, not just as a person with a mental health disability, but as someone with a disability. Um, what does that look like? How does that change my life? Um, uh, so, yeah, I, ultimately I felt more interested and I feel like uh, there's an advocacy there um, that I, dish, I didn't know initially uh, existed. So, yeah. and, and, and thank you, Mario. And uh, Mario, just as you were sharing, I just uh, wanted to make known to everyone that we're going to be doing a conference on <clears throat> mental health in the spring for New Wine. And I've already had some conversations with Mario and others about that uh, conference. So please stay tuned for that. And Mario, thank you for your insights and your perspectives that I've been learning so much from over the last uh, couple of years. So Trudy, I think you are next. Yes, thank you. Um, this, I mean, seeing all of you is delightful. I mean, it kind of puts an exclamation point when we're talking about isolation, right? And to be able to have this conversation and to hear your words that you shared on the filmings I, you know, when we started this journey way back <clears throat> with New Wine, it was, this is just sort of, I have to pinch myself because this is like, this is a start of, of a huge conversation and it's just the beginning. Okay. But I'm just praying that this just, as all of your voices come out, that it can just ring out. I mean, it's, it's just so delightful to have this come forward, but I, I'm thinking that as we're all kind of in a pandemic of isolation, um, it's almost ironic in some ways that we're talking about this, but I want so much that the disability population that doesn't get lost in the conversation of all the other things that are happening, that we can't lose sight of that. And in light of the fact that we're looking at the anniversary of the, the signing of the ADA and, and just knowing that that 30 years ago was such a move forward to not lose that, those continue those steps and to push on. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you very much. Greg and Robert and Tom. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thanks to everyone for your comments. They really are incredibly encouraging. Uh, you know, it's funny when the film came on right away when, uh, when the uh, film was taking place in Mona's office, I saw the sign ab above her on the window that says, you are worthy of love. And Mona, that made me smile right away because the first time I saw it had the same effect tonight. And that was, I thought to myself, if you haven't known the love of a person who is experiencing disability, then you've really missed out. You know, the, the, to recognize that people with disabilities, and it's a varied and, and interesting and often fascinating community, they're a gift. And if they're isolated from all of us, if they're not included, if we don't take 
steps, active steps, provide resources uh, to all of them, then, uh, then really we're, we aren't understanding fully how, how worthy we are. So thanks for, thanks for that sign in your office. Mm -hmm. She takes that with her wherever she goes. Uh, and uh, just, just on that point, you know, I think it's something that I've heard all of you as panelists say before, we need the people with disabilities, the disability community, whatever the nomenclature people use, we need people to shape our lives. Like you said, Greg, that if you haven't been loved by someone who experiences some form of disability, and we're all gonna experience disabilities at some point if we live long enough in life, you know, no matter where we're coming from, but if we haven't experienced that love, we're missing out. And uh, we're all in need of one another. We're all in need. Robert, yeah. you have mentioned that as well, the matter of giants of the faith to close off the, the documentary. But what were your thoughts as you heard others share, Robert? Well, I feel the same way I did when we did the conference. I feel ashamed that, that over 45 years of medical practice and being a professor of medicine, I did a poor job of dealing with disability, period. Oh yeah, I made some house calls and so on. But I think back, I had three steps into, the, into my office, which was an old house, and I never put up a ramp. Can you imagine that? Never. I never put up a ramp. I can't believe it. Now, you know, I've been teaching and continue to teach out here at OHSU, and I've been teaching in a nursing program, and we are not teaching anything about dealing with disability. Oh yeah, we had one short session a few years ago in which four people in wheelchairs came in and talked to the students about what um, they need to, to do to ask them what they need and so on. But you know, that's the end of it. That's the end of it. It's only in the field of um, rehabilitation that, that dealing with, uh, with, um, with disability is taken seriously. And so I'm apologizing for the medical profession. And uh, as I continue to teach in a nursing program right now, I'm gonna to see to it that we have some really firm hits on dealing with disability. Thank you, Robert. And it takes me all the way back to Mona's point earlier. Uh, it reminds me of Frederick Douglass when a young abolitionist came to the great Frederick Douglass and said, what should we do? And he said, agitate, agitate, agitate. Uh, one can't stop, otherwise one reverses. You can't stay in neutral. So I think that's a recurring theme of what I'm hearing from panelists as well, just to highlight some of these things. Mm -hmm. Pastor Tom, Pastor Tom. Yeah. Your thoughts? Well, I, um, I come at it from a pastor's perspective, as you know, Paul, and I, I, I sit here so grateful that, that when I need access to resources and people, I have them right here on the panel. That's what I thought. Because I, I know pastors don't, they just don't have that opportunity a lot of times. Many struggle. Where do they go? How do they get this started? And I, I was just sitting here so thankful to be a part of this panel and part of the whole movement to try to, um, you know, provide invitation instead of isolation to the, to the disability community in our area. I, I'm just so thankful for each and every one of the panelists. I really, I, I just sat here thanking God that, that I have a place to go, you know, and people I can talk to in this area. Um, I, I, I can't, you know, I, I, I can't be more joyful and thankful for that because so many pastors in all honesty, they spend their life in isolation. And they don't know, they don't know where to go and they don't know what to do. And I'm so grateful that, that God's opened the door for me to have so many marvelously equipped and genuinely loving and compassionate people to go to. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Uh, haunting words about the matter of isolation, even for pastors and it's painful. Yeah. Robert, you were gonna add. Yeah, I gotta add something on, on Tom. You know, at the conference, he talked about the, the remodeling that they were going to do at their church to make it more available. I go by there several times a day, and they are building. 
Yeah, yeah very good. Are. Yeah, we are. We that whole building is designed for invitation and inclusion. That's what that whole building is about. That building is built for that exact reason. And you know, it, it's costing us a lot of money, but we're all saying that's what it's for. That's why we want it. And it was built and designed for exactly that. And 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 we couldn't be more thrilled with how it's going. And and uh, Dr. Potter, thanks for mentioning that because that that every day every day I pull in, I'm so grateful because it's going to provide incredible access to people and inclusion into ministry here at Gateway. Amen. Uh, th thank you, Tom and Robert. And uh, just as Tom shared a few minutes ago, uh, just one other point that I'd like to highlight for all of us. I rarely find people who are strategic, synthetic, collaborative thinkers. Uh, movements require people being nimble and really being mindful who's to the right of them, who's to the left of them. Mm -hmm. And Tom, you said, I know people to go to, they're on the call. We often think, I need to go get that person way over there. And if only someone can introduce me to them. Movements are about who's to the right of you, who's to the left of you. Mm -hmm. One of my board, one of our board members at New Wine, who's had a major impact on me, one of the major influences of my life, Gloria Young, said that to me years ago, business leader, uh, political leader down in the San Francisco area. Uh, she has just really made that clear to me. And I think what Tom said is so key. So for those watching, maybe there are ways you can connect with the people here and in your own networks, who's to the right of you, who's to the left of you to build that movement of solidarity like Heather was talking about. And uh, we'll try and take questions later if possible from people who are posting questions. Uh, but on to the next question for the panelists. What are the obstacles we must address in the current moment? Let's start with Mona because Mona had highlighted this type of thing uh, in one way or another earlier. Would you mind mentioning one obstacle each panelist that you think we have to constantly have before us? I think it really begins with that huge lack of awareness on the part of mainstream society that that access and inclusion and participation and belonging for people with disabilities is even an issue. I think for most people, they just they don't even think about it and they don't know that it's an issue and therefore nothing is done, right? They can't jump on the movement or join in because they just, it's just not on their radar. It's not visible to them. And so uh, we need to really give voice to that so that people without disabilities and who aren't in a relationship with someone with a disability begin to go, oh, that's a problem, that's an issue. I just completely was unaware. And we can find allies for the whole movement in that way uh, once they become aware, but until they're aware. Yes, so thank you, Mona. Just the idea of people are often unaware. I'm often clueless. I'm, I'm not looking around me. I'm seeing, but I'm not seeing. And we need to make sure that we're attentive and making known to people what the issues are, who's being missed, mm -hmm. who needs to be seen and heard. And like you said earlier, to make sure we're not being paternalistic, that could be a huge obstacle. Mm -hmm. Are we asking good questions of people with disabilities to get their perspective? Ian, you're a, you're a leader in advocacy um, at OHSU. You're about making sure people have access and advocacy. What do you think is a major obstacle in our society at large or close to home in the medical community, wherever you wanna go with that? And what would you say just briefly to engage and address that obstacle? So, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, uh, echo, I think what Mona said in the, in the video, in the documentary and, and somewhat to what she just said is that the, the, the big thing that has to change is, is attitudes. And, and, and it, it's what, what not, not the attitude is is we've got to include we've got to be we've got to embrace others who aren't like us whether it's disability or race or religion or anything else uh we, we've got to bring everybody to the table so so the 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 i think the 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 one way to look about disability that we don't look at very well is I, I like to i like to highlight the things that people with disabilities have given to everybody with or without disabilities so 
in a non-pandemic world, the, the, the two things that jumped to my mind right away are curb cuts uh, that, that came as a result of people with disabilities trying to get up on curbs. Everybody uses those now in a non-pandemic way. And then the other one is door actuators. So those things both came about. Door actuators are the, the buttons that, auto, that, that, that make the door automatic. Those things came about because of people with disabilities, but everybody uses those. So if you if you take that a step further, what can people without disabilities learn from people with disabilities to make it a, a more rich, a more fulfilled world, more fulfilled life? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that the, the attitude has to shift as to what, what the problem is, as to what the opportunity is. Mm -hmm. I love that. So often we fixate on the obstacles. What are the opportunities that come through the apparent obstacles? And you had such resilience even as a child. I keep coming back to that. I've watched the documentary a few times that the banister and how you would, you know, you said, I gained strength going up that banister every day and, uh, and how your parents also were resilient. You were resilient. Your parents were resilient. You took it as an opportunity. That speaks to me. Steve Hanamura, you're a consultant. You do this for a living, on a more consulting. What is the obstacle? What is the opportunity you'd want to highlight? This I want to highlight, say hello to me, please. You would be amazed how many people will walk by a person with a disability and look at you, but not say hello. To, uh, say hello and a smile. All those other things that everybody said were fine, but the first step is, hi, my name is Paul, or my name is Steve. <laughs> believe, believe it or not, that is a beginning first step that people won't take for fear. They, they might have feelings of pity or admiration. I'm so amazing and inspirational, but what I want is for you to say hello to me. Thank you, Steve. It, it could be so simple and yet so profound. Yes. Mm -hmm. Heather, Heather. Yeah, so Steve, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, I think definitely our, one of our biggest obstacles is getting outside of ourselves and thinking beyond who we are in our day-to-day -day interactions with people and seeing other people um, that are out there and that have disabilities and recognizing them and saying hi to them like we would anybody else and not having a fear of doing so. Um, and it can become an open and enriching conversation that you never thought you could have um, or wouldn't even... Um, have attempted previously and what you can learn from it um, that can help you then be a better advocate is incredible. So I think sometimes we're our biggest obstacles. Mm -hmm. Ruben. So I was on a call today with um, I think 60, 70 different pastors in the area just talking about this, the pandemic and church and the experience of walking with people. Um, and somebody said something and it reminded me of a conversation I had with another local pastor um, two years ago about disabilities and their church. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna backtrack to that one really quick. And that one two years ago was somebody reached out and was like, can you help? We wanna figure out how we, how we provide a welcome for people with disabilities. How how we provide an invitation. And so I showed up, we talked, and my first question was just like, okay, so who do you have in your community um, with a disability right now? And they could name like one person, um, but this was a rather large church. And so I knew they had others. And so they were like, you know, kind of scrambling for those. And um, so then we just kind of left that aside and we started in on, I was talking about, okay, what is that one person you know need? To, to have full access? Do they need access? Do they need a place to sit in the sanctuary? Do they need someone to help open the door? Like, what are the, do they, can they take communion with everybody? Like, where are the places where access is limited? And, and this person stopped me midway through and said, um, I'm sorry, but it sounds like you're asking for us to completely do ministry person to person. I was like, yeah, pretty much. And they were like, that's gonna be really hard for us. And I said, why? And they said, well, you know, you're part of a bigger church we have to create programs to get the most amount of people 
touched by that one program, right? Like we're really good in the church community mm -hmm. at making programs to try to, and, and we could become this like program machine, right? Where we're just about like bringing people in and churning them out just, you know, and, and it's not okay. It's not person to person, it's programmatic. Um, and it's, it's us checking the box that somehow we've done something for this community as opposed to person to person relationship. So now fast forward to this conversation I'm in today and this person says there's something about this moment in the middle of pandemic we're all forced back to making house calls we have to call our congregants and go how you doing today we have to call our leaders and go what are you struggling with today we have to do that part of it and it's forcing pastors out of this kind of you know whatever we've become church <laughs> into this let's step back a little bit and remember ministry's always been about person to person, that it's always been a relationship. Can we, can we do that well? Um, and so I think that's both our problem um, that we as a, as, a, as a church community often lean um, away from relational uh, ministry. And we have an opportunity right now where actually the church is being forced in. And I think it's important that we take advantage of that opportunity to remind them of groups of people who have been isolated way longer than, you know, the eight months that we've been in this pandemic season and to find ways to reach out to that community right now. Mm. Yeah, Ruben is, Ruben, as you're saying that, um, you know, I'm reminded of Jesus' words, the Sabbath was made for people, people were not made for the Sabbath. It's almost like today, it's, it's, it can easily be the problem that uh, people were made for the programs, not programs for the people. And mm -hmm. we need to switch. If you notice when Greg was talking about Stephen's place, he was talking about people. Uh, Heather is the executive director at Stephen's place. We had that featured in the documentary. Uh, you were both thinking about people throughout. It wasn't simply the great programs you had, but you were talking about the people and what you're seeing. And I met some of those people, and I think I probably may have even known the, the man you were talking about, just how he's grown and developed and experiencing his own agency. And it was just phenomenal meeting one of the individuals there. And so, um, Greg and Heather, just speak to that issue, please, of Programs for people, not people to programs, as far as we need to guard against that obstacle, if you could, please. You go, Heather. <laughs> I was going to say it's it's something um, as a community, and Greg mentioned that we have 41 apartments. Um, it's something as a community that we face every day and making sure that uh each individual is represented and their individual choices and their ability to make those choices instead of, it would be so easy to say, oh, let's put this process in place or, or make this policy that most people fit into, but maybe not everybody. But that's, I mean, you and I don't want that in life. We want to be treated as individuals. And so that's why I say, I think sometimes we're our biggest obstacle, right? If we can think outside of ourselves and think what anybody else would want, how anybody else deserves to be treated in that same way. And um, so anytime you try to put a policy or a procedure in place, you're automatically taking out any individual piece that you can. And so it really has to be that person to person. Um, and that's where, that's where the benefit and the enrichment of our relationship um, and relationships with different types of people come in. That's where we get to learn um, and where we get to grow as people. Amen. Thank you. Heather, was, uh, Heather and I worked together in my prior business life for about 15 years, didn't we, Heather? Something like that? Yep. And uh, before she went to Stephen's place. And, uh, you know, I, so I knew full well how gifted she is. And um, th this, the, the world that Heather works in with individuals with developmental disabilities, their, their needs are so individual. If you, just as she's saying, if you try to treat them as a group or, you know, kind of in common uh, with respect to needs, then you're going to miss uh, so much. And, you know, it's been, it's been really a joy to see Heather and others that she works with really engage, you know, one at a time. And, uh, you know, I, as I think about it though, there's, because I love what your, your quote from Frederick Douglass, so I'll agitate for just a minute and say that there might be, we have, you know, 
roughly 20 residents right now at Stevens Place because it's a you know relatively new facility and uh, you know growing at a at a methodical pace and uh, more on the way. But uh, the need is great out there. The um, I'll talk about this in a uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but the Cooney Foundation, which is a funder in this this space, uh, we uh, in, engaged Eco Northwest to do a study for us to figure out just exactly how big is the community of people experiencing intellectual or, or developmental disabilities uh, and uh, might be uh, housing uh, insecure. And uh, one of the things we found was that that population is way undercounted. Uh, they represent a significant number of people who are actually homeless. Uh, today, you talk about the present moment in your question. Today, um, the, uh, a person experiencing developmental disabilities who gets COVID is three times more likely to die from it than, than you know, uh, someone considered you know, neurotypical, I guess is the, the modern term. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, there's a there's a tremendous need at a time when funding is going away, uh, and uh, and just society's willingness to to focus on the specific and and exaggerated needs of people in this community uh, during this time, uh, they're increasingly isolated, and so there I'm agitating. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Greg and. Uh... I think again, it's one of those things. As Mona said, we're often unaware. We have we have no idea often what's going on around us, and we need education, and we need agitation. And so, more on that to come. Uh, Robert, you do house calls. You, you've done house calls as a medical doctor, and you know Ruben had mentioned house calls before. I, I'm assuming you're motivated tonight. You're going to start doing house calls again as, as a doctor. So thoughts well, on that or something else? At least phone calls. But really, the Mona response had to do with a ver version of Mona. Seven years ago, we remodeled the, our sanctuary, our extensive remodeling. Now, we have an architect as a member of the congregation, so we were very careful to put in the ADA things. And we got a big ramp, you know, that take, takes us up to 14 inches to, to the stage level. And, of course, we've got four places in the pews where you can put the wheelchairs. But here's the problem. We now think we've done it all. That's the problem, I think. We're, that's the barrier, I think. I think we once we put in the curbs, we've done it all, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, and, right. and there's more to do. So, you know, somebody wisely said, let, let, let's get door um, openers on, on the restrooms and, and the, the main door into the building. Yeah, okay, Are we're done now, huh? No, you keep looking, you keep looking, you keep looking, you keep finding more ways that you can serve the needs of the disability community. And so I think a barrier is thinking that you've done it all. Mm -hmm. Stopping at access instead of moving on to invitation, right? Yep. Well put, yeah. Wow. Great. Yeah, and, and, and so, you know, just as Robert has shared that, Tom, and I know you're very attentive to these matters in your work as a pastor, it could be easy, couldn't it? The gateway puts in place the facilities with the structures like Robert said they you know with the architect and all that um, you're thinking beyond that Tom you're thinking about you know not stopping just to provide that access what are we going to do to keep building that so what's right. an obstacle for you Tom as you're already making headway not to close it off once you have the access point what do you do then because we easily move toward you know a, a standstill like we've done it and mm -hmm. said tonight over and over again yeah never stop so what would you say yeah that i think uh, i would go along with dr potter on that and i would also um you know it, it, we here's here's the issue you can stop there and say we're taking good care of our disabled people and people with disabilities but you need to go further to say how can we get them involved you know in other words, how can we get them involved in the ministry? And I think the big obstacle in a lot of churches is the emphasis on fixing the doors and building the facility and all that kind of a thing. But, but here at Gateway, one of our key principles is involvement of everybody that comes in. And, and it's going from, okay, we take care and they have access 
but what are we accessing them to? You know, what are they coming into? And that's the next big question. The obstacle could be, well, we do such a great job caring for them, but how are they going to bless us with their, you know, with their involvement? That's, that's it. And, and part of that just comes from my own um, background, just to, you know, the joke, the joke around here in the ministry is, you know, God, you know, the old phrase, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, the joke around here is Tom, uh, God loves you and Tom has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> and and you know, because, because I'm always constantly thinking, how can people be involved? And I always want that for, you know, for people who come in who have disabilities, I want to say to them, I don't want to just say, how can we care for them? How can we, how can we be blessed by them through involvement? And I think that's, that's the next important aspect of it because it's great to have them invited in. It's another thing to have them have ownership of ministry and involvement in ministry. And yeah. that's, that's and leadership in and ministry. leadership in ministry. When I first, when I first came here, um, one of our elders um, was having declining hearing pro issues and was going to ultimately lose his hearing. And he said, I'm going to step off the board because my hearing, you know, uh, disability. And I said, that's exactly what I don't want you to do. Because if you do, then you're, you're sending a message to the people that if you have a hearing disability, you can't be involved. And he stayed on for the next four years because I really felt like that's not a good message to send. You, you need to be involved and stay on and we will work with that so that we can have your blessing and insight as a person. Thank you, Tom. And again, as, as you're sharing here, it reminds me of something Mona has said when she shared at our conference, speaking biblically, theologically and the like, mm -hmm. uh, reflecting on Paul's words in uh, first Corinthians with the body of Christ and the gifting, uh, everyone's indispensable, uh, yep. to partner and to lead. Everyone has a distinctive area to lead in. And are we listening? Are we looking? Are we really seeking to make sure everyone has ownership and leadership <clears throat> of the pond? So then a mentor of mine, Dr. John M. Perkins said, it's not enough to, you know, give someone a fish or to teach someone a fish in community development. You got to make sure that they own the pond and they have leadership in terms of agency to the full. So um, let's let's turn to Trudy and then Mario in answer to obstacle opportunity. Obstacle opportunity. Well, Trudy I think and Mario. Uh, the obstacle I think that's just kind of in my mind right now is because we are in isolation and shut down in so many aspects. It really pushes us in some ways, it's really pushed us as churches and communities to think outside the box. And we've had to create other ways of contact and involvement um, and also mm -hmm. awareness. And um, in my situation, as a mom with a child with uh, special needs and then noticing, and there's several other women and many of them are single moms that are now isolated because many of their children are um, vulnerable, you know, medically. So they can't be out in public, but then they, you know, so we're using Zoom to just have contact mm -hmm. with these folks and have conversation. And every week we meet up. And to be quite honest, these mo moms probably wouldn't have made that such a priority because it's a self-care, it's a self-survival thing as a caregiver. And I'm going, this doesn't need to stop when we're not in isolation anymore because that's the one piece I see is that caregivers lose that importance of saying, oh, I've got to find care for my, my, my child or my young adult so that I can go do something for me when that doesn't seem important. We need to, but now we say we, that's not an excuse. We have the technology, the ability to be able to have this contact and it's vital. And so I think in some ways, um, this whole realm of different world has pushed us to say, you know, it doesn't have to be the same way as it was before. Let's look at it differently. 
and be creative. And I think that that pushing the envelope and pushing the creative creativity is what's really important right now. Yeah, yeah I love that word on looking for opportunities and, and being creative. Yep. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Mario. Yep. Can you, yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. As far as obstacles go, I was thinking a lot um, about this um, when I was looking at the, um, reviewing the documentary. Um, I, in my old life, I should say, like probably when I was in college and then shortly after when I started clinical practice in my old life again, um, the notion that like we would read things and read information and then we would see this standard deviation, this plus or minus 10 on a lot of the information that we're getting, it's now hitting me that I am <laughs> that plus or minus 10. I'm not just a marginal loss. Like, so I think one of the, ob the obstacles would be to stop seeing people as that, to stop seeing people um, who have challenges or disabilities of any kind as just, oh, standard deviation is just a plus or minus 10. Let's just move on. Let's deal with the, the larger um, body or the larger numbers of individuals that are coming in. Um, it's because I'm now disabled, I'm now thinking differently about that. So I feel like that would be um, a big issue or that is an obstacle, um, being able to see us as people, not just numbers um, or marginal um, or standard deviations. And then as far as opportunities go, um, I think this is probably more so now for me because of this COVID um, season that we're in. I think rethinking or revisiting like the anatomy of our worship, um, like a lot of this was already been discussed where reasonable accommodations are being considered, you know, um, things are being done to modify places of worship so that people can be accommodated. I love the fact that um, that is being done. I'm even now reflecting back to my pastor, my childhood pastor and how he, you know, he put in an elevator to the church um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, he really, he was trying to think about certain folks and yet he just announced his retirement like two weeks ago, 33 years. Um, so I feel like one of the opportunities would be um, revisiting and just rethinking how we do worship. I think that, you know, that was mentioned. Um, and I think I even learned a good year ago from, if I'm not mistaken, it might've been Mr. John Jacobs who's on the line with us now about like the average reasonable accommodation was less than a thousand dollars or something like that. Um, that it's not really that big of a burden as people think or as businesses may think. Um, so I feel like that's something that that would be an opportunity that, you know, for us to look at, to revisit what, you know, a reasonable accommodation as being reasonable. <laughs> so that's it. A lot of good, a lot of good reflections there, Mario. Thank you. And uh, I don't know if Ian was going to say something in response there. <laughs> No, I, I would. Uh, it's, it's actually a lot less than a thousand dollars on on average. Uh, accommodation is about four hundred dollars, according to this is all pre-COVID, uh, obviously. But uh, according to the figures I've seen. So um, thank you, Ian and Mario. And you know we only have till midnight tonight for this panel. Uh, they asked if they could stay on till two, and I said no. We got to we got to finish at midnight, and we could keep taking. I have all kinds of questions to ask. I know there are questions from those uh, who are watching and we still have some closing reflections ahead of us. So I'm in a real bind here. Uh, and I do really wanna honor people's time. Uh, as we said, we would finish around 8.30. Uh, but um, let's take one or two questions from those who've raised them on Facebook, et cetera. And I'll ask one person, because I've asked my colleagues here, I've gone through two rounds of questions with each one and every one of my colleagues here as panelists. If one of you could respond to uh, one or two questions, one person each. Matt, can you share what one or two of the questions are? Yeah, so a uh, question coming from Facebook um, says, uh, that the, the words allyship, advocacy, and even activism uh, used in light of recent social and cultural events. So he, the uh, question says, I've heard these words used in, in light of recent social and cultural events. Are these terms relevant to this discussion? And if so, how, especially to those who are outside of the disability community? 
So one again, person, Ali Kasi activism. Mona, did you say you were going to? I'd be happy to speak a little bit to it. I think if you look nationally at disability voices and happen to uh, search for and look for those who are active in on Twitter and social media in advocacy work, just in general public advocacy work, that absolutely those words are are used, those terms are used. We have a group here in Washington state, I live across the river in Vancouver that are, are called allies in advocacy. And it's really all about all kinds of people with all kinds of disabilities working together to advocate policy level and governmental level. And they absolutely use the word ally. Um, and advocate has long been a term used in this arena. So um, absolutely, I think they're good terms to use. And I just encourage you to just Google, you know, disability advocacy and an allyship and see what pops up. You'll have hundreds of thousands of references. Thank you, thank you. Another question, Matt? Do we have another question? Uh, yes, it was a question on uh, developing um, for church leadership to develop and reach out to the church population for the ministry of disabilities. And the question was, is that uh, they've tried this on their church staff, but there was never buy-in by uh, staff volunteers and individuals, and it never developed, and it, or at best, it was superficial. So what can be done to help gain buy-in from uh, church members? One person, one panelist, please. Anyway. Starts with the pastor, the, the, who's ever in leadership needs to source that, and it needs to be in their heart, hopefully, to make that happen, and then you enroll people, maybe one or two at a time to get it started. Thank you, Steve. Do we have one more question, Matt? I see Dr. Potter is is going to come in. He's going to do a house call on me if I don't let him let him speak, so I'll, I'll let him come in in a second, but Matt, was there one more question? And then I'll come to Dr. Potter. Um, the, the, there was one more question from YouTube on talking about, uh, resources from the documentary as to where to find some of those. And so I think, uh, for, for that one, I, what, uh, my response is, is underneath the documentary. So there will be, um, in the description on our YouTube page, anyone going to that will be able to find any of the links for resources that uh, were spoken about um, from the documentary. So uh, if you'll give us 24 hours, then we will repost uh, the documentary on our YouTube page with uh, links uh, for resources in the description, as well as links for any of the experts and panelists that you've seen. Um, if they have contacts and things like that, uh, information that they've shared, that that will all be in the description panel. So. Be sure to subscribe to if you're watching this live on YouTube or if, even if you're watching this live on Facebook, be sure to subscribe uh, to the YouTube page or like on the Facebook page and then you'll be notified for the resources coming directly uh, in relation to this documentary. Thank you, Matt. Brilliant. Uh, appreciate all your good work. Uh, Robert, you were going to share uh, something. No, I'm not going to share. I'm going to embarrass you if I possibly can, Paul. Just as I apologize that the medical profession has not been training its leadership to deal with disabilities, what are you guys doing in the seminaries to get your pastors to take yeah. this seriously? Preach. Yeah. Okay. Give oh. us an answer, Paul. Yeah. Okay. Well, New Wine does this stuff all the time. And uh, that's why we're doing this tonight. And New Wine is at the seminary. And New Wine is at Multnomah University. So touche, Dr. Potter. Now, does that mean we've accomplished it? No. No. No, no, no. Well, let agitate, me also agitate, agitate. We have a long way to go. So, yeah. but I am saying we are taking steps. They might be baby steps to quote from one of my favorite movies. What about Bob? But we are doing it and we have a long way to go. It's a marathon race, not a sprint. Yeah. And with Bob, that, I do want to thank, with that, I do want to thank Multnomah University and Seminary. And I want to thank New Wines Board and our advisory council for all the work that they've done some of whom are actually on this uh, panel tonight. Um, I'm going to be turning it over in a minute to uh, Mr. Greg Goodwin to share some thoughts about the Cooney Foundation. I thought I heard someone call out my name and I don't think it was God. Was that, who, who was that saying? I think my that name? might've been me, Paul. Um, that wasn't God, it was you, Tom. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, it definitely wasn't God. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, Dr. Potter, that uh, I have a class called Theology of Community and Ministry, and we teach uh, disability in that class. All the students who go in there, we, we address these issues in that class, pastoral care, disability, how you work through that. So it's one, it's one slice and one start of getting this issue to the forefront. And that's at Multnomah Seminary, right? Yeah, Multnomah yeah. Seminary, exactly. Yeah, and, and again, the, the point, Robert, I appreciate the point. I banter with you a lot, but uh, of course, we need to be held accountable. Iron sharpens iron, and we all need to be sharpened by one another. So um, I really appreciated the work of uh, Greg Goodwin and uh, also others, Angela Holt, uh, of course, Heather with Stevens Place, but the work of the Cooney Foundation, uh, they have been really supportive of our ventures uh, related to this work that we're doing with uh, disabilities uh, and moving toward inclusion and full participation. And I really wanted uh, Greg to share a few words in, in closing uh, about the work of the Cooney Foundation for our viewers and listeners before I close it off. So Greg. Thank you, Paul. I promise I'll be brief. Hey, but before I, uh, I do that, I just, I really wanna thank the folks who uh, are, uh, have, have some form of challenge or disability or, or someone in their family in that situation that appeared with us on the film. You know, I particularly value uh, all of you showing, you know, ability, not disability. And so thank you for that. It was a gift. Uh, I also wanna just mention real quickly that Cooney is spelled K-U-N-I. Uh, please visit cooneyfoundation.org. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, work that we have done recently that uh, we're very excited about. And also Stevens Place, uh, Stephen spelled with a PH, stevensplace.org is another place to learn about the work that, uh, that we're involved with that Heather is responsible for. So uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, the Cooney Foundation recently funded a data study uh, regarding uh, how large the, the community of people experiencing IDD is uh, in the Northwest uh, relative to you know, the, the, uh, the sort of the, the old numbers that apply to, these, to this community. And uh, I hope you'll take a look at the study that is on, on our website. Uh, also, if you subscribe to the Portland Business Journal, it will be inserted in your paper this week. Uh, and it's generating a lot of interest and excitement in the community because it really does show how uh, unhoused uh, folks uh, experiencing IDD are and how severe the need and how uh, often uh, or how seldom, I should say, their needs are, are addressed when we're talking about uh, public housing and housing support. Uh, a lot of people experiencing IDD as adults uh, have some form of funding, but as was pointed out, it's often quite minimal and it rarely addresses housing. And so a significant challenge, especially for families because they're just sort of expected, I think, by the larger community and by uh, public policy to, uh, to address those needs on their own. So uh, please take a look at that. Uh, just quickly about Cooney, I had the privilege of uh, working with uh, Wayne Cooney as his business partner and CEO of his company that uh, he built uh, starting in 1970. Uh, when we sold the company four years ago, uh, Mr. Cooney, who passed away in 2006, his shares uh, and those of uh, Joan Cooney, who was also an, an owner in the company, were all uh, donated to the Cooney Foundation. Cooney Foundation works in uh, supporting cancer research and uh, supported housing for uh, individuals with uh, IDD. And uh, they had two children in their family uh, who uh, uh, were faced with these challenges. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cooney were uh, very innovating, innovative and creative. Uh, and, uh, and they agitated for support for their children, uh, even when they were told they should institutionalize them. And so they both had that lived experience that uh, led to their incredible generosity. And so I got to, uh, to work for Wayne for a long time and I still think I'm working for Wayne and uh, we get to, uh, to devote our resources to supporting those two causes. So that's enough uh, for me. Uh, thanks, Paul. It's really been a privilege to work with you and everyone here. 
I certainly agree with Tom. Uh, I feel like I've met a lot of people that, uh, that I want to know better. So uh, thank you and, and bless all of you and bless the work that you're doing. And happy Thanksgiving. And happy Thanksgiving to you too, Greg, and others with us tonight. And Matt, any thoughts in terms of like what you were saying earlier, anything else that you need to share before we close off? Uh, so for those of you who have been joining us, again, we want to thank, uh, on behalf of New Wine, want to thank our panelists here tonight and those that have been involved with the documentary. And this is a part of what New Wine's um, breath and our hope is, is that uh, continually stepping into communities, continually stepping into culture to build relational bridges through Jesus Christ. And so we are inviting every single one of you who have been generous with your time this evening uh, to participate with what New Wine's doing, as well as what you've seen through the documentary. And again, as I said before, uh, come back to our YouTube page. If you go to the YouTube page forward slash uh, New Wine, New Wine Skins and hit subscribe, then it gives you an opportunity to participate in the many different things that New Wine's doing. Uh, the documentary on disabilities is one aspect of what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to, again, engage culture uh, through the lens of Christ. And so we also have then on Thursdays, every Thursday again tomorrow, you can join us at 1 p.m. live on Facebook uh, for our New Wine Table Talks. And that's 1 p.m. Pacific time where we continue to engage culture. And tomorrow we're going to be taking a look at the liturgical calendar. Uh, Dr. Metzger has a book that has just been published called Setting the Spiritual Clock. And so that's an opportunity for those of you that have ever wondered about uh, the church calendar or how that can actually play into who we are as a uh, created image in the image of God. And then entering into dialogues such as this uh, on disabilities and how that we can become uh, those who seek to serve and to elevate the other, regardless of how different the uh, other is. And because they are different, we love them because they allow us to see the truth of who we are and the creativity in this God. Uh, that we are seeking to love by serving the other. So we have new wine table talks. We have new wine uncorked. We have new wine, uh, uh, again, things like this, new wine tastings where Dr. Metzger, Dr. Harper, and those that are leaders at new wine continue to engage uh, those around us for the sake of building relational bridges. So many opportunities. Again, thank you so very much for involving uh, new wine in your evening uh, tonight. And so uh, many opportunities to get involved Lastly, before Dr. Metzger closes us out, new-wineskins.org is our website that has all of these um, uh, aspects of what New Wine is all about. And then those of you who are readers, uh, I know in today's age of PDFs and uh, online, we, we actually uh, also have a uh, journal, Cultural Encounters, that takes up articles, academic articles, uh, dialoguing about these very things that we've been dialoguing about. We have a journal uh, devoted to the disabilities. We have uh, conferences through New Wine that we're going to be doing in the spring also uh, from isolation to inclusion on disabilities. And so there's a lot of things that are going on with New Wine, and we would love for you to continue to participate with us uh, through those avenues. So that's it. Thank you, Matt. And again, thank you very much, Matt and Lynette, for all the work you've done. Others, we've mentioned the panelists just really appreciate your expertise and your passion. And for all those who joined us tonight, who's to the right of you, who's to the left? And thank you for joining us, being a part of this tonight. And I just wanna close in prayer and pray that God would really move in and through our midst. And after I pray, I'm gonna ask that Trudy Sang, uh, who's a leader at New Wine, to close us off in prayer. So we'll pray together, Trudy, uh, if that's okay with you. Lord, I just thank you so much for our panelists. I thank you for the people watching and listening tonight. Lord, we at New Wine have so far to go in terms of moving toward full participation, equity and justice that people are experiencing ownership and also leadership in our communities at large. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear people. As Dr. King said, we need to move from a culture of things to persons. That's such a problem in our age, Lord. Let us not treat people as less, but all people as more, as created in your image. And Lord, lead us forward. Thank you for these panelists. Thank you for those watching and listening. Energize us and lead us forth, Lord, for Christ Jesus' sake and for the world's sake, Lord. Amen. Trudy? Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray a word of thanks 
for this moment in time, for this conversation that we could have with these dear people. God, just bless this conversation, but let it not in here, but let it go deeper and more expansive to the world around us. Guide us, I pray. Bless our steps. And even in this crazy world that we're in right now, we know that it's not impossible. Let your power reign. Guide us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blessings to all and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm.